As a candidate, Mr. Trump was quick to criticize Wall Street, but that's where he found two key figures for his economic team. He chose former Goldman Sachs partner Steve Mnuchin to be Treasury Secretary and billionaire investor Wilbur Ross for Commerce Secretary. The appointments raises questions about Mr. Trump's economic agenda above and beyond helping manufacturers. And the president of investment bank Goldman Sachs, Gary Cohn, will head the National Economic Council. He would be the third Goldman alumnus in a top Trump administration post. Mr. Mnuchin has strong ties to Wall Street after a 17-year career at Goldman Sachs, where he pioneered block trading, the selling of big chunks of shares at once. This makes him a traditional pick for the job, but contrasts with Mr. Trump's message. Wall Street has caused tremendous problems for us. I don't think it's a done deal. It's not officially confirmed, but it looks as if Gary Cohn, the chief operating officer of Goldman Sachs, is going to become the third former Goldman Sachs executive to chair the National Economic Council. Uh, of course, that is a relatively recent position created under the Clinton administration. Bob Rubin held it then. Uh, now he's going to fill out his cabinet. And the other interesting thing, Steve Mnuchin, as you know, a Goldman Sachs guy, mm -hmm. another Goldman Sachs. And this is where the irony of draining the swamp is starting to get, you know, it's starting to look very bizarre. Another Goldman Sachs guy, uh, the number two guy at Goldman Sachs, who was a actually the first one of the first supporters of President Obama on Wall Street, Gary Cohn. Remember when candidate Trump railed against Hillary Clinton's connections to Goldman Sachs? Well, that was then, this is now. More than ever, bankers are calling the shots at the White House. Trump appointed Stephen Munchen as Treasury Secretary, Gary Kahn as top economic advisor, and James Donovan as Munchen's deputy. All are Goldman alumni. Others include Trump advisor Steve Bannon, Jay Clayton as head of the Securities and Exchange Commission, and Dina Powell as White House advisor. Now that Trump is in the Oval Office, his Goldman Sachs team has wasted little time dismantling the joke known as Dodd-Frank, put into place after the economic implosion caused by the big banks. Today brought the number of Mr. Trump's executive actions to 20. Today we're assigning core principles for regulating the United States financial system. Doesn't get much bigger than that, right? That executive order directed the Treasury Department to look for ways to roll back the Dodd-Frank Act's regulations. I disagree, but I also think we have to get rid of Dodd-Frank. The banks aren't loaning money to people that need it. The banks will give me all the money I need because I don't need the money. Anybody that doesn't need money is a great candidate to get money. If you need money to create jobs, to build something, whether it's buildings or a company, the banks aren't there. The regulators are running the banks. And that's why our country, I mean, people can't borrow money today. Goldman Sachs has ruled the White House and economic policy for over 25 years. Trump is continuing the policy of allowing bankers to call the shots, as they have since the administration of Bill Clinton. He did the investment banking sharks a big favor when he worked to repeal the Glass-Steagall Act that put a firewall between commercial and investment banking. Uh, the role of uh, Democrats, I would say, has been at least as great as the role of Republicans. Um, the, the most important deregulatory legislation was actually passed in the Clinton administration, championed by uh, Robert Rubin, uh, who was uh, Secretary of the Treasury, uh, former CEO of Goldman Sachs, and then also Larry Summers, who was first Deputy Treasury Secretary and then Treasury Secretary. Uh, first, there was the repeal of Glass-Steagall, the law that separated investment from commercial banking. And then in 2000... And that was under uh, Clinton. The yes, under, under the Clinton administration. And then in the year 2000, also in the Clinton administration, uh, the Commodity Futures Modernization Act, which actually banned regulation of all so-called over-the-counter derivatives, including the credit default swaps and many other instruments that were at the heart of the 2008 crisis. But, but, but from the standpoint of Obama, Bill Clinton, Hillary, and so forth, we had a reshuffling for the last 25 <coughs> years. 
the same, not just policies, but with actual physical real people that have gone through the Bill Clinton administration, right. through the right. Obama administration, and Hillary Clinton. So you take someone like, um, well, Robert Rubin, who was, who was the Treasury Secretary for Bill Clinton. Now, right. of course, he went to Citigroup. When he was at Citigroup, who was working under him, not under him, but, but in, a, in one of the places in Citigroup that imploded, but Jack Lew. Jack Lew was the Assistant Secretary of Domestic Finance for Bill Clinton. He is the Treasury Secretary for Barack Obama. He became the Treasury Secretary after imploding an element of Citigroup that was bailed out, and after Hillary Clinton plucked him from Citigroup to become her Deputy Secretary of State. Right. So it's it's the policies, it's it's, it's the, the disgust at them, and even if you don't know these individuals' names, it's, it's the revolving door that happens at the right. very, very top level of Washington and Wall Street. By any standard, Goldman Sachs is a criminal organization. It violated the law. It ripped off customers. It shelled out almost $9 billion in fines for shady dealings. Nobody went to jail. Instead, they went to the White House and the Treasury. Trump talks about restoring law and order, but this doesn't apply to Wall Street. It is one of the frustrations of, of the recent financial crisis has been the lack of accountability uh, for a lot of the acts, uh, and not just the criminal acts, but also um, acts of civil liability and the lack of accountability on behalf of the regulators who, who so fell, fallen short in their jobs. Goldman has shelled out millions in political contributions. It lavished cash on the DNC Services Corporation, a Democrat PAC, the Republican National Committee, Hillary Clinton's presidential campaigns, and those of Marco Rubio, Jeb Bush, the National Republican Senatorial Committee, and others. This isn't a recent phenomenon. Goldman has infiltrated administrations for years. Bill Clinton had Robert Rubin, Bush, Henry Paulson. The Obama administration was rife with banksters. His election campaign funding was dominated by Goldman Sachs, AIG, Morgan Stanley, J.P. Morgan Chase, Bank of America, and Citigroup. Liberals like to blame Republicans for Wall Street influence, but they forget that Obama's policies led to record profits on Wall Street during the first two years of his administration. In fact, Wall Street amassed more profits in the first two years of the Obama presidency than all eight of George W. Bush's combined. Goldman Sachs gained a foothold in Washington during the FDR administration. Sidney Weinberg ran the company at the time. He threw his weight behind Roosevelt and soon dominated the Democratic National Campaign Executive Committee. After FDR was elected, he put Weinberg in charge of the Business Advisory and Planning Council at the Department of Commerce, a direct pipeline between corporations and the government. Weinberg would go on to advise five more presidents. In the 1990s, then co-chairman of Goldman Sachs, Robert Rubin, groomed the unknown governor of Arkansas, Bill Clinton, for the presidency. Rubin helped Clinton gain the support of Wall Street and the funding he needed for his campaign. Clinton repaid Rubin by creating the National Economic Council and appointing him chair. Rubin soon became Treasury Secretary. His mission was to get rid of the Glass-Steagall Act, otherwise known as the Banking Act of 1933. The law separated investment and commercial banking. It prevented security firms and investment banks from using deposits for risky investments. In 1999, Clinton signed a bill rolling back Glass-Steagall. Basically, Franklin Roosevelt, through the Glass-Steagall Act, created an absolute wall of separation between commercial banking, which was urgently required for the functioning of the entire economy. This is commercial banks basically are depository institutions. Uh, they take uh, deposits from customers. They issue commercial loans. They issue personal loans. And at every level of the economy, uh, things function through the commercial banking system. On the other hand, you've got investment banks, you've got insurance companies, and now in the recent several decades, you've got other exotic phenomenon like hedge funds and private equity funds that didn't even exist back then. But the whole idea of Franklin Roosevelt 
was that you've got to break up the big banks. You've got to break up a system in which depositors' funds could be speculated on by bankers who were engaged in this entire range of activity. So in 1933, the Glass-Steagall Act passed, and within a very short period of time, commercial banks were completely separated out from all of this other speculative activity. And from that moment on, uh, Wall Street had been absolutely committed to the idea that Glass-Steagall had to be crushed. Rubin was also instrumental in the passage of NAFTA, legislation signed by Clinton that shipped jobs out of the country. When NAFTA destabilized the Mexican economy, Rubin convinced the president and Congress to bail out the banks. During the Bush administration, Goldman Sachs CEO Hank Paulson, who had previously worked with the Nixon administration, became Secretary of the Treasury. He convinced the Securities and Exchange Commission to change its regulations so that investment banks could operate as if they had the kind of collateral that super banks like Citigroup and J.P. Morgan had. This resulted in Goldman Sachs, Lehman Brothers, Bear Stearns, and other investment banks leveraging themselves to a dangerous degree and set the stage for an economic meltdown a couple years later. When everything fell apart, Paulson acted as bankster czar. He allowed Lehman Brothers to die and handed Bear Stearns over to Superbank J.P. Morgan. He then turned his attention to Congress and convinced Nancy Pelosi and the Democrats in the House to pass a $700 billion bailout package that would save the banks from their reckless and criminal behavior. Before us, I think, is this. Is the risk of doing nothing greater than the risk of buying $700 billion of illiquid securities? The argument for it, of course, is that uh, those illiquid, illiquid securities may turn out to be an okay investment. The best argument against it is it's basically socializing losses after Wall Street types have pocketed profits. During the election campaign, Donald Trump said he would work for a 21st century version of Glass-Steagall. Uh, is there any plans for the president to meet with Senator Sanders and is repeal of Glass-Steagall on his agenda? There's no current schedule to meet with him. I'm sure that, as he has done with several other members of Congress, um, from both sides of the aisle that at some point that will be scheduled. The call for rolling back the great vampire squid was opposed by his Treasury Secretary designate Stephen Munchen and Commerce Secretary designate Wilbur Ross. Bankers dismissed the call for a new Glass-Steagall and said it doesn't stand a snowball's chance in hell of passing. At some level, I wish that we would. I wish that we could. I would like the idea to be that depositor, as, as Senator Warren says, that banking is boring, mm -hmm. uh, that we get to the back to the days when the, these depository institutions that we as taxpayers are guaranteeing are utterly separate from other kinds of activities. I don't think that that's a realistic uh, view, however, anymore, both because of the commercial realities of the world and the, and the power of the, of the various yeah. lobbies. Because what we have today and what we've had in the wake of the repeal of the Glass-Steagall Act is an environment where the largest banking institutions have been able to increase the concentration of their capital, of their influence, of their power. And this has been subsidized and substantiated by political forces within the White House, the Treasury Department, the Federal Reserve, governments throughout the world, in particular throughout Europe, the ECB. And it's something that we really need to contain and look forward to changing. Um, if we want to have more economic stability for the greater citizenry at large. Trump's populist rhetoric about breaking up Wall Street and the banks is just that, rhetoric. Goldman was never seriously worried about reform or a new Glass-Steagall. After the election, its stock surged nearly 40%, a new all-time high and its market value surged by a whopping $4 billion on the day Trump signed an executive order rolling back Dodd-Frank. Trump has shown where his loyalties are, with Wall Street and the bankers. Dodd-Frank offered no real protection for the American people, but Trump's move to gut the legislation should serve as a warning. The banksters are once again on a roll, and the American people now risk losing their savings, homes, and pensions.
For just a small subscription fee, you can become a member of the NewsBud community and help keep this website running. Your subscription will provide you with full community access to exclusive content, including videos and articles from NewsBud's team of experts and analysts, as well as a members-only monthly newsletter from NewsBud's founder, Sabelle Edmonds. Sign up today for full access at NewsBud.com.